Hey everybody and welcome back to another tier list. Today we're going to be going through the discography of the Boston band Swirlies. Like many other bands that I've covered in this series, Swirlies is a group that is often associated with the early 90s shoegaze movement, and they have albums that are considered classics within that genre, but to describe them as just a shoegaze band would be far too reductive, and they are a truly fascinating and unpredictable band with this amazing mix of wide-ranging styles such as indie rock, noise pop, electronic, dream pop, math rock, twee pop, and of course shoegaze. And they have a pretty small discography for how long they've been together, but they certainly went through some fascinating evolutions of sound and really stretched out their songwriting more and more throughout their five album discography. And this is a group that I do think a lot of people are sleeping on, and I think they deserve a lot more recognition for the very interesting contributions that they have made to music. And I think they were very ahead of their time, especially for the early 90s. So what I'm going to do is go through their five studio albums. I won't be including EPs on this one, and according to Wikipedia, they have five studio albums. And there's honestly very little information about some of these albums uh, online, and I haven't even been able to find very many interviews of anybody from the band as well. There's a couple of written interviews here and there, but uh, very little information, way less than I was expecting when I was looking into this band. So they do seem to be a group that is kind of mysterious and low-key, and I definitely think that that also adds to the mystique and the fascinating elements of this group. Uh, but I'm going to go through the five studio albums, starting with Blonder Tongue Audio Baton and going up to Cats of the Wild Volume 2. And I will go through each of those and score them on this tier list, with S being the highest and D being the lowest. And I'll talk a little bit about each album, let you know my thoughts, and we will see where we end up. And please feel free to let me know your thoughts in the comments, where you agree and disagree and how you would rank these five albums. I would love to hear your thoughts. Okay, I think that's about it. Let's jump right into it. All right, starting out, we have their debut studio album from 1993 titled Blonder Tongue Audio Baton, and I will give this one an S. Probably not a big surprise to anyone. Absolutely amazing first studio release. Prior to this album, Swirlies had released their first EP titled What to Do About Them, and that release very clearly demonstrated that unique Swirlies sound that contained this beautiful mix of shoegaze, indie rock, dream pop, lo-fi, and noise rock. And this album is very much a continuation and further expansion of that mixture of sounds from the first EP. But on here we have an expanded palette of different sounds being utilized with the addition of synthesizers. This is also the only Swirlies album to feature Shauna Carmody, and she would contribute guitar, vocals, and synth. And I think having the contrast between Damon and Shauna on vocals gives everything a really nice balance, and I think they complement each other perfectly. I always love whenever a shoegazy type of group alternates with male and female vocals, and I think this album is a perfect example of that. We have 11 tracks opening up with a short 12 second untitled intro and then it goes into the first full song of the album titled Bell. And in my opinion, this is the most perfect song that they could have chosen to bring the listener in. Everything about this song is just super engaging. Right from the opening chord, you're hit with this dissonance that's aggressive and hard hitting. And when I first put on this album and heard this track, they completely had me. I particularly love the contrast between the first two sections. The first section being so dark and intense, and then the second section getting into some more resolved sounding chords and feeling a little more peaceful. And throughout this song, we hear the very cool and unpredictable section changes that are such a staple of Swirly's wild sound. And then after that, it goes into Vigilant Always, a song with really beautiful harmonized guitar chords. I like the sparse vocals that Shauna adds throughout, really adding a nice touch. And another song that ends up in a completely different territory than it started in, but they managed to bring it back again for the last chunk of the song. Then they continue with His Love Just Washed Away, a vibey and spacey song that chills things out a bit. And up to this point, this would be the most repetitive song. Not really any crazy, unexpected uh, section changes on this one. And then we have a two-minute transition track
track titled His Life of Academic Freedom. And this is one of the two songs on here that Shauna and Damon recorded at home on a four track cassette. And I think it's a cool song to change things up and provide a little breather before the next chunk of the album, which starts out with Pancake, which is probably the most popular song from this album. And the first song to feature Shauna on lead vocals. Incredible song and definitely one of my favorites on here. The guitars on this one in particular definitely have that shoegaze sound going on. And then that is followed by probably the next most popular song on here and my favorite track from this album titled Jeremy Parker. I think these two tracks are the best succession of two tracks on this album. And this song is just so beautiful. I absolutely love the guitar chords and the melody. Great call and response vocals between Damon and Shauna. And just an overall very dreamy and euphoric song. Song. And the instrumental groove at the end when they mess with the timing is so cool and just a perfect and badass way to wrap up this incredible song. After that, we have Park the Car by the Side of the Road, which brings the energy up more with a faster tempo. And another song where I particularly love the contrast between the two main sections. The opening section being more gritty and rocking, and then the second section takes this turn that is so beautiful and euphoric. I absolutely love the vocal melody from Shauna over that second section. Just two perfectly contrasting parts. Then the album continues with Tree Chopped Down, a song with some particularly interesting guitar chords. I've always loved Swirly's use of really unorthodox chord voice voicings and interesting harmonic movements and I think you can definitely hear a few of those in this song in addition to other tracks on here like Bell and Vigilant Always. Then we continue with Wrong Tube, another beautiful song with Shauna covering most of the vocals. And I feel like any time a Shauna vocal track comes up on this album, it is always in the perfect spot and provides the perfect contrast from the Damon-centered tracks. And then the album concludes with the other track that they did at home on a four-track cassette titled Wait Forever. I love the lo-fi vibe of this one with the reversed effects. And I like the fact that the album concludes with another Shauna vocal track. The song cuts to silence for about a minute and then goes into a dialogue of a guy talking to a friend about watching a show about moths and a spray that they can release to cure a virus. Uh, a bizarre and humorous little conclusion to the album. And these monologues will continue on other releases as well. So it's a little uh, kind of ongoing theme that we get throughout some of the Swirly's discography. But yeah, like I said before, an incredible debut album to put out there, expanding on the sound from their first EP with the added instrumentation, and just an incredibly solid batch of songs with fascinating guitar voicings and harmonies, adventurous and unpredictable section changes, beautiful use of dynamics, great blend of all of the different styles that they offer, and a great mix of vocals between Damon and Shauna. And for Shauna only being there for one album, she definitely left her mark and Pancake is one of Swirly's most popular songs and will forever be associated with her. So incredible album, this one gets an easy S. Alright, continuing, we have their second studio album from 1996 titled They Spent Their Wild Youthful Days in the Glittering World of the Salons. And again, I will give this one an S, probably not surprising to anyone. Absolutely incredible album, and this one would go down as my favorite Swirly's album. This one continues in a similar stylistic vein to the first release, but also expands on the instrumentation with the use of more synthesizers, as well as electronic drum loops and because of this further experimentation in the studio this one would feature a few more transitional tracks that veer off into some more electronic and unexpected territories and I think it makes for a very fun and adventurous listen there would also be a change in the lineup in this group as Shauna would have left and formed the band Syrup USA and she would be replaced by Christina Files and the original drummer Ben Drucker was also replaced by Anthony DeLuca and in the midst of these changes, I think they did a really great job of putting out a record that stayed true to the sound that they had established on the previous release, but also expanded on it a little bit, but still very much sounded like the swirlies that we heard on the previous album. And I think Christina was a perfect replacement for Shauna, and she fit right in with her sound, and I really enjoy the fact that we still have that contrasting vocals between Damon 
and then the female vocals uh, on this album as well. Very similar to the previous album, it opens up with a short intro track that has a guy speaking in French over some sounds, and then they hit us with the first full track titled In Harmony, New Found Freedom. Absolutely amazing song, and this is probably my number one favorite Swirly song. And again, like I said on the previous release, I don't think they could have opened this album with a better song. This was actually the first song that I ever heard by the Swirlies, and it completely brought me in, grabbed my attention, and piqued my interest, and really made me want to explore everything that this band has. The way it opens up with the clean guitars and then the drums enter and we get those hits where the dynamics really pick up and then it changes gears and goes into some really colorful and pretty territories with these beautiful harmonized guitars and then it brings the dynamics back up and weaves all of these sections together while still bringing it back to the earlier parts later on in the song. Just incredible track. Then we have No Identifier which is a minute and 40 second transitional track giving us a short lo-fi instrumental and then it goes into Sounds of Sebring, which introduces Christina Files on vocals, and I think this is a really beautiful and dreamy song. I love the guitar chords. The harmonies between Christina and Damon are really pretty, and Christina's vocals just fit perfectly within this sound. Very cool use of synth sounds over the later part of this song as well. Then we go into San Cristobal de las Casas, another absolutely beautiful track with great harmonic movement, pretty vocal melody, melodies, great use of dynamics, and cool time signature changes in the instrumental section. I had mentioned at the beginning of this video that I think there are some math rock elements to Swirly's sound, and I would say that the instrumental sections of this song is a perfect example of that. After that, we go back into the electronic territory with a shorter track titled You Can't Be Told It, You Must Behold It. Interesting song with some unorthodox samples being utilized and some good vocal Vocal layering of Damon and Christina and then it continues with Pony. This is a song that is more stripped down with no drums and just one repeated electronic pattern with lots of guitar layers and different sorts of sound effects being utilized. A really cool song and another nice contrast and change in mood and energy from everything else that we've heard up to this point. Then we have another dialogue track, a short humorous track titled Do You Know Anything About Love, which serves as a setup for the next song, which is Two Girls Kissing, which is probably the most popular song from this album. Amazing track with a great vibe and great lead vocals from Christina. I've always considered this song to be like the pancake equivalent of this album. Then we go back into the electronic territory again with Sterling Moss. Nice fusion of electronic drums, synths, and guitars and a very pretty song. Then we have another short transition track called Boys Protect Yourself from Aliens, which features a return of the drum beat from track six. And then we go into another one of my favorite songs from this album titled Sun. In terms of the experimental and dissonant chord voicings that Swirlies utilizes, I think the opening two chords of this song might be my favorite dissonant chord movement of any Swirlies song. Both chords have so much tension on them and create so much eerie dissonance dissonance and I think it's just such a cool and unusual sound that very few bands really experiment with and this entire song is loaded with amazing guitar work and would definitely have some of my favorite guitar parts of any Swirly song. When Christina's vocals enter it's very satisfying too and I love the synth sounds going along to her vocal parts, a song that really takes you on a journey of so many different emotions. Then we have the last full song of the album titled The Vehicle is Invisible and I I think this is a beautiful song that has a really serene sort of feeling to it. I like how the first half is more stripped down and then the second half brings in the band for a bit and then goes into all sorts of unexpected directions and wraps things up very nicely. Then we have the outro track which is called French Outro. I honestly have no idea what's going on when I listen to this one but again another track that adds to the unexpected nature of Swirly's music and never knowing where things are going to go. But I think this is their best album. I think they took everything that they had established on the previous album and expanded on it with the further use of electronics and further experimentation with interesting guitar chords and unorthodox harmonic movements. And if I was to make a list of my top 10 favorite Swirly songs, I think this album would have the largest number of songs on that list. So because of that, this is my favorite Swirly's album and this one gets an easy S.
Okay, moving on, we have their third studio album from 1998 titled Strictly East Coast Sneaky Flute Music, and I will give this one a B. I think this album is all right. There are definitely moments throughout it that are very fun, but at the same time, I do have some issues with it in terms of the drastic stylistic shift that it took from the previous releases, as well as the way some of these songs are assembled and pieced together, which I think does cause some issues with the momentum of the album at certain points. And at 64 minutes in length, I do think that it is a tad longer than it needs to be, and it can feel like it's dragging a bit at times. The music on on here is comprised of remixes of songs from their first two albums being done by a variety of different DJs and producers. At this point in the group there are only two members left with Damon as well as the bass player Andy Burnick which is what led them to take on this more collaborative remix sort of route and the majority of the songs are done in an electronic fashion with lots of samples and some shorter transitional tracks here and there that go into some ambient and experimental territories as well as some drum heavy techno and dance grooves and from a stylistic standpoint this sounds completely different from the first two albums and if i didn't know any better and i didn't know the songs that are being remixed i would think that this is a completely different group and in a perfect world i would have probably rather had them put out another album that was more similar to the first two releases but obviously at this point in their career and with the state of the band it had led them to take this stylistic detour and I think it resulted in an album that does have some great moments scattered throughout but it also does have some moments that to me feel like skip over underwhelming tracks that probably could have been left out and I do think that if this album was shortened a bit and wasn't so long it could have improved it to some extent because because there are a handful of tracks on here that I don't think really add to the album very much at all and instead just make the album longer and drag on more than it needs to. For me, there are a few high points scattered throughout this, starting with the In Harmony Retrograde Transportation remix uh, by DJ Spooky. I think that is a really awesome take on that track and would probably be my favorite song from this album. I also love Sun, Drunk in Your Sled, remixed by Adam Pierce. I love the short little transitional track, Not Like a Geese, Like a Swan. I would love to find out what piano part is being sampled on that track it sounds like something classical and it's very pretty i also really enjoy the version of san cristobal de las casas remixed by rich costi the vocals are really euphoric and satisfying on that track uh, some of the more electronic songs give me tastes of Aphex Twin as well, which I love. I also enjoy Who Was In Situate on the 4th of July. I think that's a really cool track. And I also really love the first half of the closing track, Tor's Empathy Jam. I love the chordal guitar part and the spoken word that's happening on top of it. I think it provides a really nice contrast from the rest of the album, which is more heavy on the electronics. And like I said, not every single song is a home run for me on this one. There are certain tracks that don't add to the album for me and are skip overs like Sea Wolf Edit, T Fuzz Mix, a sneaky flute field recording, and Boys Protect Yourself from Aliens, among a few others. But in the midst of that, I would say there are some really great moments and a couple of tracks that I do love, but Again, there's still a handful of songs that don't do anything for me and I think could have been omitted from the album entirely and shortened it up a bit. So an okay album, but definitely not on the same level as their first two releases. So this one will get a B. Okay, next we have their fourth studio album from 2000 titled Damon, Andy, Rob, Ron, The Yes Girls. And I will give this one an A. I think this is a very good album and definitely an improvement from the previous release. This album is quite the adventure to go through, fusing together so many different styles and again, veering off a lot from what we had heard on the first two albums and still incorporating a lot of the electronic elements that we heard on the previous release, but now utilizing them with more vocal-centered songs and songs that are incorporating more electric and acoustic guitars. This album takes us through a myriad of different emotions going everywhere from dreamy, ethereal, 
playful, adventurous, and sometimes disorienting. It has 11 songs, with the opening and closing tracks being 40 to 45 second intro and outro tracks, so we have nine full-length songs on this, and I think the majority of this album is very enjoyable and has some really awesome tracks. I really love the first full-length track, One Light Flashing I Love You. Really cool electronic vibes mixed with guitars and psychedelic vocal sounds, and again, similar to what I've said in a lot of other songs, I love the contrast in mood between the first two sections. When the second section enters, it goes into some really beautiful territories. The instrumental on this one is also one of numerous songs on this album that gives me cartoonish video game sorts of imagery. I also love the follow-up song, You Make Me Sad Girl, a nice down-tempo ballad. I love the layering of the guitars and the low brass sounds, a pretty song that contrasts the song before it very nicely. Dolphins Dance With Our Music continues things very nicely with another more mellow song with stripped down instrumentation and mostly just vocals, guitar, and some light keys and percussion. Then they change things up with Jack Bucky's theme, which brings us into an acoustic, darker, folky sort of track that is very surprising when it comes in, but I really enjoy it and I appreciate the little detour that it takes us on. Then we have Subway, which is another song where the instrumental gives me cartoonish video game vibes. I absolutely love this track. It would probably be my favorite song from this album. I love the keyboard sounds and the way it's layered with the guitars and the way the vocals are sung and mixed creates such a trippy atmosphere. Then we go into Indian Ocean Nosedive, which I would say is probably the song on this album that is the closest in style to the first two Swirlies albums, aside from the drumless nature of this track, but I do think the guitar and vocals have the closest resemblance to their original sound, and I think throwing in a track like that was very effective and also still very much fit with this new style that they are building off of. This would probably be my second favorite song from this album. Then after that, we have Pony, which is a surprising choice. It's a song that we had already heard on their second album, but they re-recorded it for this. And again, a song that is more mellow from a guitar and vocal standpoint, but it has this energetic percussion pattern repeating over it, which creates this really fascinating dichotomy of feels on top of one another. And uh, a nice little surprise to hear an already released uh, Swirly song getting thrown in on this album. Uh, and then the album continues with March of the Sneaky Flutes, Another one that instrumentally gives off very cartoonish video game types of imagery. I like the way this track completely changes vibes on us and gives us a nice little detour to set up the final two tracks of the album, which start with a cover of the police classic Every Breath You Take. I think this cover is a really cool interpretation of this track. I like how they modify the guitar and how he completely changes the style of the vocal phrasing and the percussion as well as the dark production create this very cool and dreary effect that gives the song a whole new interpretation. And then the album concludes with a short untitled track with some acoustic guitar and spoken word. Again, I never completely understood what they're talking about in this dialogue when they do, uh, but maybe someone can fill me in on it. But all in all, I think this is a very enjoyable and adventurous album, and I think they did a good job of utilizing those electronic elements that they had started on the previous albums, but still kept the guitars prevalent and created this great hybrid of electronic and indie rock with some very slight elements of the swirly sound that we got from their first two releases. So a very good album, an improvement upon the previous release. This one will get an A. Okay, and lastly, we have their fifth and most recent studio album from 2003, titled Cats of the Wild, Volume 2, and I will give this one a B. Similar to their third release, this is another album that I have very conflicting thoughts about. There's definitely some stuff on here that I really like, and I do think the production is also improved from the previous album, but there are a few big things that do take away from this album a bit for me, and I will get into those. Uh, it opens up with the same opening track from the previous album with one light flashing I love you and I do like this version a lot more the production has clearly gotten better and it just sounds like a more polished 
version of that song and I believe on the previous release it was done on a four track so it makes perfect sense why this one sounds so much more refined and then it continues with Give Us Moon Rocks which I would say is the strongest song on this album absolutely beautiful track with awesome guitar parts pretty melodies and just an overall super solid indie rock song then we continue with Lay Bag, a cool experimental rock track with some darker harmonies going on in the guitars and lower distorted vocals that are also soft that create this really awesome effect. Then we have another track that was on the previous album with Indian Ocean Nosedive. Again, better production and a preferable version of this song. But at the same time, instead of having a couple of remixed tracks that we have already heard before, I think I would have much rather just heard new songs because the two new songs that I have heard so far are both very good. And I would say that would be one of my critiques of this album that lands it in B tier instead of A. I just really wish that they would have included more new songs instead of having a couple of remixed tracks that we've already heard before because the two new songs that I've heard so far are both very good. And that would be one of my critiques of this album that does land it in B tier instead of A. Then we have a track titled Sleepy Time, and this is a song that I'm sort of indifferent about. I don't dislike it, but I don't really care for it either. It would be one of the songs from the first half of the album that I'm not super crazy about. I do love the follow-up though, which is titled Rare Moment, another super solid indie rock song with some very cool guitar parts going on with a couple of very dissonant chords here and there that very clearly sound like the types of harmonies that they utilized on their early albums. Then we have Little Tail, which takes us more into that electronic guitar hybrid that we heard a lot of on the previous release. Another song that I'm not super crazy about, but I wouldn't say it's a bad song, just not one of the standouts on here for me. And for me, once it gets to this track, from this point on, the album kind of loses it. We have four tracks left, and the next three are all silent tracks with no music. I'm not really sure what the intent was of doing that. But for me personally, as a listener, I don't really think that this adds anything to the album. And it basically just creates this thing where you need to just skip over three tracks when you're listening to the album. Uh, obviously not a huge deal, but another thing that I do think takes away from the album a bit. Uh, again, if they just put three more you know, new original tracks in place of that, I think it could have been a lot better. Uh, and then the final track is titled Cats of the Wild Forever, which is an almost 16 minute electronic experimental blowout that takes all sorts of weird twists and turns into different moods and different directions. And there are moments throughout this that I do find enjoyable, but in the grand scheme of the 16 minute song, I don't find it particularly engaging. And again, I don't think it really fits or adds to what they had established on the first seven tracks of this album. So because of the two re-recorded and reused songs as well as the three untitled silent tracks and the experimental closer those three things do take away from this album a bit for me but at the same time some of the new originals on here like give us moon rocks lay bag and rare moment are all very good tracks and i think this album could have potentially been a lot better if they just hit us with maybe three or four more originals uh, rather than the weird detour that it takes from tracks 8 to 11. So not one of my favorites of theirs, unfortunately, but it still has a few quality tracks and a couple of fun moments. So this one will get a B. All right, so those are my takes on their five studio albums. I feel like a lot of people have probably heard the first two Swirlies albums and left it at that. And I was definitely in that same boat for a while, but it was really interesting to see where their music had gone after those first two releases. And in general, I find this band very fascinating. The fact that they've never broken up, but they've undergone a lot of different personnel changes, but also haven't really put out very much new music since the mid 2000s and the fact that they still occasionally tour on the East Coast, which I think is very cool. So a very unique band, and I would really love to hear some new music from them and see what types of sounds Damon has been creating over the years, because he is certainly a very unique songwriter and a musician who produces some truly unique and very different sounds. So for anybody who hasn't checked out their full discography, I would definitely recommend it. Uh, you can also purchase these albums on Bandcamp if you would like to support them more, and I will leave a link to that in the description. And I think that is about it for today. Thank you so much for watching. I hope it was enjoyable and hopefully you learned a thing or two. And if you are interested, please feel free to check out some of my other tier lists linked in the description and the comments and see if there's anything else that you might like. All right, that is it for today. Thanks again for watching and I will see you at the next video. Take care.